You guys doing okay? Everybody good? Good? All right. 2024, did you guys ever think we'd make it this far? <laughs> yeah, me neither. I didn't either. Yeah, glad you guys are here. Glad we're still existing. So thank you guys for, uh, for coming out this morning. Good to see you guys. Good to see the, the church full. So I'm happy about that. Cool. All right, we've been working through 1 Samuel. If you're new here, um, this is what we do. We go through whole books of the Bible. We happen to be in an Old Testament book of the Bible. And a lot of people kind of neglect the Old Testament. If you've been coming to this church for any length of time, we've done a lot of Old Testament books. I think they're pretty fun. I think they're pretty wild. They're like R-rated movies, but they give us uh, really good morals and teach us good lessons. So um, that was the worst analogy ever. I'm so sorry. If you're new here, uh, we will get to, to some substance in a second. Give me, give me a minute. I just got to warm up. So... <laughs> So we have been working through this Old Testament book, um, 1 Samuel, and, and where we're at right now, and again, if you haven't been with us, it's easy to catch up, and every chapter has a lot of lessons within itself, so, so it's okay if you've missed the previous ones. Where we were at a week ago, we were in chapter 22, and what we have been seeing so far in 1 Samuel, or, and we talked about this a little bit last week, there are, there are two paths. There's the path that the first king of the Jewish people is on, Saul is his name, and this is a path of selfishness, of rebellion to God, doing whatever you want to do, um, living your life however you want, and that is leading Saul down a certain direction. It's not a very good direction. The other path that we have been seeing is the path of God's will, and that's the path that David, who is going to be the second king of the Jewish people, that's the path that he is on, and we're seeing this, this kind of chasm grow wider and wider and wider between these two paths we really kind of see a, um, like a climax or a crescendo of that in the chapter that we covered last week. What has happened is Saul is hunting down David. He's doing everything he can to catch David because he wants to kill David because he's jealous of David. And in chapter 22, Saul comes across a priest that has helped David, which is not out of the ordinary. And um, this priest has helped David, and, and Saul interrogates him and asks him a bunch of questions and falsely accuses him of a bunch of things, doesn't like how the priest, Ahimelech is his name, doesn't like how he answers Saul's questions. So Saul has the priest and 84 other priests murdered. And then he sends the same person that murdered all of them to, to a community called Nob, which was a community of priests and their families, and um, had the entire city wiped out. Uh, no telling how many hundreds of women, children, all the livestock, everything completely wiped out. So we kind of see paths, uh, uh, Saul's destructive path um, reach kind of this zenith point where it's, it's, it's the worst we've seen it so far. We talked about that. And one of the important things about going through the Bible the way that we do is, um, you know, it was the end of the year last, last week. And when a lot of churches, and I'm not making fun of any in particular, are probably doing, you know, cheesy like, you know, new year, new you, garbage like that, um, we actually talked about the Bible and we talked about real things that are happening on, uh, happening and, and, and going on. And the reason why that's important is just because it's a new year doesn't mean that all the problems of society are going to somehow magically melt away. We still have to deal with these things. We still live in an aggressive society. We still live in a very uh, aggressive culture. And that doesn't mean that we can't have a great life. It doesn't mean that we can't flourish. It doesn't mean that we can't build relationships and have peace and contentment. But if we're going to have those things, we have, to, we have to know the adversary that we are facing. And that's what we talked about a little bit last week. What we're going to talk about this week um, fits in nicely with that. We're going to talk about uh, God is our source of power, that there is a power that we have when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when we have the Holy Spirit of God, there's fruit that comes from that, gifts of the Holy Spirit that come from that, and there is a power for us to live the way that God wants us to live in a way that does not only honor him, but does make us content and give us peace and joy and all the things that we aspire for, uh, but we have to be in a relationship with God. And we're going to talk about that relationship and, and, and kind of the byproducts of having a relationship with God, Okay. So you should have got a notes handout when you walked in. Everything will be in there. Everything will be on the big screen behind me. This, this thing here is called a book. Uh, this one here is called the Bible. We are in the Old Testament. That's the first half of this book. And um, we're in the 23, 23rd chapter, and we will get through it relatively quick today. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have notes, for some reason you can't see the screen very well, um, if you have a, a smartphone, 
the Experience Community app. Just click on Sermon Notes. We've got everything right there for you, okay? So we should be in good shape. So um, thank you guys for being here. I, I, I genuinely mean that. It, it's very encouraging to see, see a lot of people in here. So let me pray. We'll jump into chapter 23. We'll talk about some fun stuff and um, see where God takes us this morning, okay? All right, let's pray. Father God, we love you. Ah, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for everyone in this room this morning, God. I thank you um, that as we're starting off this year, God, that we would start it off thinking about you, thinking about the things of you, God, building a relationship with you. And so, God, as we do that a little bit this morning, as we read and we study and we take communion a little bit later, I pray, God, that you just keep your hand on your church, Lord. Um, Bless us, God. Protect us. Keep your hand on us. We don't just pray for our church, though, Father. We pray for every church in our city. Pray for our other campuses, Lord, the churches in those cities. And we pray that, that as we do this today, God, that in some way, some small way, God, it will, it will honor you back and make you proud and bless you in some way. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We pray all these things in your son's name, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's this one word, if you've ever been with me when we do the Old Testament. I listened to it phonetically. I studied the Hebrew. I'm saying it correctly, but it just doesn't feel like it. And for some reason, the author of this book of the Bible wrote this one word 600 times in this chapter, something like that. You'll you'll recognize it here in a second. Here we go. It was reported to David, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kailah and raiding the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord, should I launch an attack against these Philistines? The Lord answered David, launch an attack against the Philistines and rescue Kaila. But David's men said to him, look, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more if we go to Kaila against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go at once to Kaila for I will hand the Philistines over to you. Then David and his men went to Kaila, fought against the Philistines drove their livestock away and inflicted heavy losses on them. So David rescued the inhabitants of Kailah. Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Kailah and brought an ephod with him. Okay, so if you weren't here last week, so Saul comes in, he orders the slaughter of all the priests in an area called Nob. He is unsuccessful at killing all the priests One of them, a man named Abiathar, gets away from them and runs to David, and David takes him into his kind of uh, um, band of misfits, right? This group of misfits, guys, uh, that trust in David. So David, while he is in an area called Hereth, he gets word that the Philistines have attacked another city, and it is a fortified city. That means there's a wall all the way around it. One way in, one way out, there is this fortified city. And after hearing that, David prays to God and says, God, how can I help these people? What do I do about these people? What's interesting about that is David is not the king yet. It is not his responsibility to save these people from this area. But because he loves these people, right, he's going to inquire with the Lord and see what he needs to do. Now, it seems like David has learned his lesson from chapter 22 that before David makes any big decisions, he needs to consult with God first. That's just a good life lesson for all of us in this room. Before we make any big decisions in our life, we should ask God what he wants us to do first. And so David has learned this lesson, and we see that he does this at the beginning of this chapter. So God responded to David. What do I do, God? God says, attack the Philistines. Protect these people. Save these people. Now, because David's men were afraid, now, if you've been here with us, remember David's men, there was about 400 of them that he started off with. We're going to find out in this chapter, he's got about 600 men. These are not like uh, well-trained soldiers. These are the discontented kind of outcasts of society that found refuge and protection with David. So these aren't like the cream of the crop. And so they're afraid. They're like David. David. We're already afraid running from Saul, and you want us to go to battle with the the army that is known for having giant men and who are super well-trained and they have the best weapons. That scared them. So David listened to him, and he goes, one second. He goes back to God, and he's like, God, are you sure? Now, here's the thing. 
There is nothing wrong with us approaching God multiple times about the same question. Now, now I'm not, we need to trust God. I'm not saying that we don't trust God, but I think God shows us grace because God knows that we're human, right? And we, we get afraid sometimes and we see a large adversary and we look at it and we're like, are you sure, God? And so sometimes we may inquire about the same thing multiple times. And I think God has grace for that and that's fine. The thing though that we need to balance that with though is this. We cannot let the fear or doubts or insecurities or opinions of other people deter us from believing the truth of God's word. You hear me? It's okay. Look, we've been against adversaries and I'm like, Lord, are you sure? But we need to make sure we don't let outside voices plant seeds of doubt in our faith in God and God's ability and what God wants us to do, okay? So David followed God's commands and that was advantageous for them. It's always advantageous for us to follow God's commands. He followed what God wanted him to do. He faced his enemy and he was victorious over a seemingly much stronger enemy. And in his obedience to God, David's, he was able to save a lot of other people. Now this sounds very, very churchy. But regardless of how big the adversity is that stands in front of us, if we will be faithful and, and trust God and listen to God and build a relationship with God, we will overcome whatever adversity is in front of us. So the Bible even says we, we are more than overcomers. If we are faithful, if we trust the Lord, if we put our hope in him, we don't have to worry about what's in front of us. And when we're obedient to God, that positively affects those around us. Do you know the good things that we do in our relationship with God that doesn't just affect us? If you're, if you're a mom or a dad in here and you build your relationship with God, you're not the only one that is affected by that. Your children will feel the effects of that. If you bring the, the, the truth of God and, and how we are to live into your workplace, your coworkers will be blessed by your relationship with God. Your family will be blessed by your relationship with God. Even if you're not blatantly saying it all the time, your actions in living in a Christ-like manner, it affects other people. It helps other people. It may even lead to the salvation of other people like we see with David here. So Abiathar is the priest. He's the last remaining priest, right, in this area. And he brings to David what's called an ephod. It's a vest that the priests would wear. And this shows that David not only trusts God, but he also trusts the priest. He also trusts the, uh, uh, the, the kind of ministry, the order of the ministry in that day. He has hope and he has faith in his spiritual leadership. So that's all fine and good. What eventually started to happen in, in Jerusalem and, and in Israel during this time, though, is as time went on, people started to view the vest of the priest, the ephod, is kind of like a lucky charm, right? That, that if they were gonna go into battle, hey, grab the ephod. As long as we have the ephod and we hold it up in front of us, everything's gonna be okay. It was, it was kind of this very superstitious action. And 3,000 years later, we read that and we're like, man, those people are crazy. I never talk to Jesus, but I'm gonna be okay because I got this little cross on my necklace. I never pray, I never read my Bible, but I got this really cool piece of distressed wood from Hobby Lobby that has a scripture that I really don't know. I got that right there, right? And so we often become a little superstitious, a little religious, and we lack that relationship with God, and we need to step back every once in a while. You know, listen, there's this really neat piece of artwork over here, this big cross that, that an artist who comes to this church made years and years and years ago. It's really, really neat. There is no power within that cross, though. The only cross that has power is the one that Jesus Christ died on. And so, you know, we can walk around and march around and, 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 and it's okay to look at iconography and to, to maybe make it jog your mind and think of the things of God, but, but there is no power in little necklaces we wear. Nothing wrong with wearing them. We have to make sure we have a relationship with the one that died on the cross. That's the key, okay? All right, let's keep going. When it was reported to Saul that David had gone to Keilah, he said, God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself by entering a town with barred gates. Then Saul summoned all the troops to go to war at Keilah and besiege David and his men. When David learned that Saul was plotting evil against him, he said to the priest, Abiathar, bring the ephod. Then David said, Lord God of Israel, 
Your servant has reliable information that Saul intends to come to Kaila and destroy the town because of me. Will the citizens of Kaila hand me over to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, please tell your servant. The Lord answered, he will come down. Then David asked, will the citizens of Kaila hand me over, uh, hand me and my men over to Saul? They will, the Lord responded. So David and his men, numbering about 600, left Kaila at once and moved from place to place. When it was reported to Saul that David had escaped from Kaila, he called off the expedition. David then stayed in the wilderness strongholds. Remember, strongholds is like a, like a safe space, like an oasis. In the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, Saul searched for him every day, but God did not hand David over to him. Now, we're going to talk about a truth here in a second. It's a very depressing, pessimistic truth, but it's an important truth. We'll get to that here in a second. So after Saul was told that David was in Kaila, he ironically believed, look at this, he ironically believed that God had given David over to him. If you have been with me for any length of time, it is not hard to see that Saul is the bad guy. Saul's the bad guy on a huge scale. Again, he just ordered the murder of hundreds of people in the chapter right before this. And now Saul thinks that God is on his side. And then he has handed David over to him. Let me tell you how you get to this point. Listen to me this morning. If we are religious versus relational, or if we're living in sin, we do not have the ability to decipher when things that happen around us are of God or not of God. So if you only come into this building, you know, once a week, which is four times more than the average Christian in the United States, if you come into this building and you don't participate, you don't pray throughout the week, you never read your Bible, you're not in any kind of community, you're not contributing back to the church, anything like that, you just come, you spectate, and then you leave, you just look and leave, right? If you do that, when things happen around you, in this life, because we don't have a relationship with God, we have religious action that we do, going to church every week, but we have no relationship with God. When things happen around us, we don't have the gift of discernment to understand if those things are because God did them or those things are because the devil did them. We have no ability to discern. So over the years, I've had people who come to church here, you know, you know, once or twice, three times, maybe a month, and they will seriously say things like, hey, I think God wants me to leave my wife. Really? Has she committed adultery? Has she abused you? Has she abandoned you? No, but I just, you know, I found this other thing and it makes me happy and I'm gonna go that way. And I'm like, you're not hearing from God. No, 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 I am, I am. I think God told me this. No, because God's not gonna tell you something contradictory to his own word. But if we're not in the word, if we're not in relationship with him, we can't decipher what's of God and what's not of God. People do this all the time, guys. And we buy into a false narrative that we're good, right? Because I feel good in the moment. It feels like it's God. And it may not be a blessing. It may be a curse. But if we do not have the ability, if we don't have a relationship with God, we don't have the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. So David had Abiathar bring the ephod. And he prayed. David goes, what do I do about these people? What do I do about Saul? He asked two questions and God answered them backwards. Yes, Saul is coming. And yes, the people are going to sell you out. So David did the right thing. He obeyed God. He did all the things he was supposed to do. And there was not an immediate reward for that. In fact, it looked like he was getting screwed over. And there's a lesson in this. Even if we do the right thing, the rewards are not always immediate. This sounds kind of heavy. The rewards may not even be on this side of life. They may be on the other side of life in heaven and eternity with God, but we have to trust that God sees the good that we do and that God will reward those things when he's supposed to reward those things. So David's love for his people, here's the hard lesson. David's love for his people outweighed his own concern for himself. He risked his life. He gave up, he gave up his time. He, he put it all on the line to help a bunch of people. And what was the result? They didn't care. 
They didn't care at all. And we learned a very difficult, uh, sad, but also very true lesson in life that we will rarely get out of people what we put into people. Those of you who have a couple of decades under your belt, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You rarely get out of people what you put into them. There have been times over the years here, and I'm not trying to cry the blues or anything, but you know, we've had a lot of people come through this church. It's, it's a big church, and we've done, as a, as a team, I have as personally, we've done some pretty benevolent things for people. People who are in dire situations and we've drove, you know, you know, three, four hours to go help someone or go do something and things like that, only to see these people grow apathetic and walk away from the church, right? Or to even see some of them turn around and say awful things about me and awful things about other people at the church because we wouldn't continually bail them out of their repetitious bad things and things like that. And so you do all these things, sometimes only for people to go, mm, I don't care, or maybe even to turn on you. Now, listen, that shouldn't deter us from loving people because even when we were at our worst, Romans says that Jesus still loved us. We can't give up on people because God doesn't give up on us and we are to love people because it is the will of God, because it is the desire of God, because it honors God, because we cannot properly love him if we don't properly love his, his creation as well, okay? All right, this next part. So David was in the wilderness of Ziph in Horesh when he saw that Saul had come out to take his life. Then Saul's son Jonathan came to David in Horesh and encouraged him in his faith in God, saying, Don't be afraid, for my father Saul will never lay a hand on you. Uh, you yourself will be king over Israel, and I'll be your second in command. Even my father knows this is true. Then the two of them made a covenant in the Lord's presence. Afterward, David remained in Horesh while Jonathan went home. If you haven't been here, um, Jonathan is, is not a major character. Like he's not in the book of 1 Samuel a lot, but he's a very, very important character. He's a man of righteousness. He's a man of principle. He's a man of integrity. And he's David's best friend. And ironically, also Saul, who wants to kill David. It's his son. So David is lying low in an area called Horesh. That word literally means uh, like a dense forest. So he's in a very dense forest hiding out. And, and while he's in Horesh, Jonathan comes to him and, and just basically encourages him in his faith. This is such a simple lesson, but if we have friends in our life, I hope, I hope all of us have a couple of friends in our life, that we have to intentionally check up on our friends. That we have to make sure, hey man, you Okay. And then we have to dig in a little bit. How, how's your family? How are you? How's your marriage? How's your relationship with your kids? You gotta dig in. How's your relationship with God? Right? Are you praying? Digging in a little bit. Why? Because we love him. And Jonathan came and did this. He was digging into David a little bit. But he was also encouraging David. So Jonathan was a godly man, godly person. And he even valued righteousness over his own relationship with his father. He says this, my dad knows that, that you're supposed to be the king and I will stand behind you. He valued righteousness even more than he valued flesh and blood. And again, we don't need 30 people like this in our life. You're not gonna find 30 people like this in your life, but you need three of them. You need four of them. You just need a couple people like this who will be honest, they will be encouraging and they will point you towards the things of God. Well, Corey, I'm blessed. I got this girlfriend. Whenever I get in a fight with my husband, she takes me out drinking in Nashville, right? That's not the kind of friend you need. You need the kind, of, the kind of friend where if you get in a fight with your husband, your friend goes, hey, I know a good counselor in Franklin that maybe you can go see. Hey, why don't you get a hold of someone at the church? Why don't you guys get into some marital counseling? Are you guys praying together? Is there anything that we can do for you? You need someone who's going to direct you in the things of God. So one, do we have people like that in our lives? And are we being those kind of people to others? Are we being that kind of friend that is not only being honest and encouraging, but pointing them towards the things of God, pointing them towards righteousness, okay? All right, last part. So some Ziphites came up to Saul at Gabeah and said, isn't it true that David is hiding among us in the strongholds in Horish on the hill of Hakila?" south of Jeshimon. 
So now whenever the king wants to come down, let him come down. As for us, we will be glad to hand David over to the king. May you be blessed by the Lord, replied Saul, for you have shown concern for me. Go and check again. Investigate where he goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is extremely cunning. Investigate all the places where he hides, then come back to me with accurate information and I'll go with you. If it turns out he really is in the region, I'll search for him among all the clans of Judah. It's the southern part of Israel. So when he went to, uh, so they went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness near Mon in the Arab south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to look for him. When David was told about it, he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Mon. Saul heard of this and pursued David there. Saul went along one side of the mountain and David and his men went along the other side. Even though David was hurrying to get away from Saul, Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them. Then a messenger came to Saul saying, come quickly because the Philistines have raided the land. So Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to engage the Philistines. Therefore, that place was named the Rock of Separation. From there, David went up and stayed in the strongholds of En Gedi. Okay, so the Ziphites, which in my weird little mind, I imagine like a a tribe of people who are into like sci-fi movies and run really fast. I don't know why, Ziphites. Anyways, so <laughs> the, Z- <laughs> the Ziphites were spying on David while David was hiding out in, in, the, in the, the, the trees in the forest of Horesh, and they reported this to the king. They ratted out David. Now, this is the second time that David has been ratted out by his own people in this chapter. Not only was he ratted out for the second time by his own people, these weren't just Jewish people. These were people from the same tribe of Israel that David came from, and they ratted him out. And with even more irony piled on top of that, Saul's response, God bless you. This is crazy. This is a guy, again, who just murdered hundreds and hundreds of people. It just shows how confused Saul is. And again, we read this and we go, man, that guy was nuts. I remember like back when people still watched the Grammys when there was good music and, and people would come up to get awards and you would have like, you know, some hip hop artist from East LA and they would get up there, you know, I don't know, let's say his name's Dr. Dre or something. He'd get up there and these guys would receive these rewards and go, you know, thank, thank God. Thanks be to God. I just want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm like, you just wrote and got awards for some of the most ridiculous disgusting, vile music ever. But, but what happens is, again, when, when we think religion somehow saves us and we're not in a relationship with God, you know, someone murders a bunch of people and then goes, hey, God bless you. God bless you. You guys see this kind of stuff all the time. Maybe it just doesn't, maybe we don't consciously think about it. We see people living in blatant sin, but talking all, all godly all the time. And, and it doesn't make sense. So, The Ziphites sold out David because they were afraid if David came into their neck of the woods that it would disrupt their lives. It would cause them to maybe have to sacrifice some comforts, some security. So they valued themselves more than they valued David and his men. Now, here's what happens, guys. When we live in selfishness, we talked about this last week, we live in opposition of God. And when we live in opposition of God, Just like when we do good things and it has a ripple effect, when we're selfish and we're living in opposition to the teachings of God, that also has a ripple effect. Let's go back to the parenting thing, right? If I'm a a parent, I have two kids. If I am selfish, if it's all about, you know, climbing my way up the corporate ladder and making a lot of money and making sure that I impress all my neighbors with all my fancy stuff all the time, and I do that so much where I work 80 hours a week and I never spend time with my wife and I never spend time with my children because I'm selfish and materialistic, you're not the only one who's going to be negatively affected by that. It's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your wife. It's going to affect those around you, right? 
If you're a woman in here and, and you're selfish and you neglect your children because you're holding on desperately to your youth and you want to make sure that your girl, you know, your daughter's you know, friends think that you're a hot mom too and you do all this kind of stupid bull crap, eventually that selfishness and that lack of character is not just going to affect you. It's going to affect the people around you as well. If we act foolish at work, if we're lazy, if we're, you know, if, if we're doing things incorrectly, if we're not considering others, this affects those around us. And what ends up happening is when we live in selfishness, we actually become advocates, conduits of evil hurting other people. Inevitably, it starts to hurt other people where we are actually aiding in progressing evil. That's what happens. Our sin doesn't just affect us. It affects a lot of people around us. And again, if you've been with me for the book of 1 Samuel, maybe this is kind of out of nowhere, but, but I don't know if you've ever thought of this. Why is David even running from Saul? David was the strongest, most cunning, most agile, you know, most fierce warrior in all of Israel. He just beat the Philistines. He's beat them multiple times. He and his men could have turned around and they could have taken Saul and his men pretty easily. So why didn't he do it? Well, some think that maybe he was outnumbered. Well, the, the number doesn't matter because he was outnumbered against the Philistines and he won that pretty easy, pretty decisively. Some people think, well, maybe he was against uh, uh, starting a civil war. Well, there was already division in Israel. You had Judah, the lower half, Israel, the northern half. So that doesn't really work. So why didn't, why didn't David turn around and fight? The reason David didn't turn around and fight, we'll see in the next couple of chapters, he didn't fight out of respect and out of love for the appointed leader of his people. His leader was corrupt. He was selfish. He was godless, but he was still God's chosen person to lead until David took over. So David respected him and he cared for him and he refused to kill him. Interesting thing. Just, just ponder on that one for a second. So as he's running, right, David is running from Saul. They're on the same mountain. And this is, if you can imagine in your head, they're, they're going down this side of the mountain. Saul's men are catching up to them. They keep getting closer and closer and closer. And right when Saul's men were on the heels of David and his men, miraculously, a messenger comes up to Saul and says, hey, you have to stop pursuing David. The Philistines are attacking our people. You got to stop this and you have to go deal with that. And so David was saved and Saul called off the pursuit of David. They went back and they dealt with the Philistines. And in this moment, in this moment, David was saved from direct conflict. There's going to be more, but in this moment he was delivered. And sometimes God does that guys. Sometimes right in the nick of time, God steps in he pulls us out of a bad situation. He takes care of the adversity that's right in front of us. He makes sure that everything is okay. He comes in and just like miraculously does something. God does that sometimes. But most times, he doesn't. What do I mean by that? Most times, God allows us to go through the adversity because it is in that adversity that we learn to trust him. I'm going to, a little spoiler alert. David was really, really close to God when he was running from Saul. You know when David screwed up? When he was king. That's when David screwed up, when he was comfortable. So it is in the hardships that we learn to trust God. It is in the hardships that we have character that is developed. It is in the hardships and in the adversity that we develop wisdom, right? And that's why God, that's why the Bible says that God puts us through a refining fire to clean out the impurities and make us pure when we come out the other side. But you have to have the fire to purify the gold. And that's how our lives are at times, okay? Let's go back to the beginning for a second. David did not have to help the people of Ka'ilah. He didn't have to. He wasn't the king. It wasn't his obligation. But listen to this. Because David had a relationship with God, he felt conviction to come to the aid of other people, even though that put him in an inconvenience and even in harm's way. He didn't know all the people. The people weren't even nice to him or good to him, but he felt conviction to go out of his way for those people because God had gone out of his way for him. 
So we have to ask ourselves this question in this room. And as we get into this fun election year that we're going to get into, right? Do we have, you and I, a love for all kinds of people? All kinds. Not just people that vote like you or think like you or look like you. Not just people that have the same religious views as you. Do we love all people? That doesn't mean we condone what all people do. That doesn't mean we compromise on our beliefs, but do we love all people? All people. Do you know the Bible talks about this? The Bible even says non-believers, it says pagans, but non-believers, they can even love people that are just like them. Even non-believers can get along with people that are like them. The Christian is called to go beyond that. That we are called to love, as Jesus says, even our enemies. Even those that want to harm us, that we love them, that we want what's best for them. We want them to know the truth. We want them to be blessed with, uh, by God. We want them to be saved. We want those things, even for people that are vastly different from us. Do we understand that Christianity focuses on a collective good? That it's not just about you and I. If you're new here, we talk about this kind of stuff a lot. But American society, American culture is hyper-individualistic. What that means is this. Culture tells us that it's all about the individual. It's all about me, right? My truth, my desires. You know, my life is a movie about me and you all happen to be minor characters in it. It's all about me. It's about the individual. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it to you. That is not biblical, the biblical way that we look at people is we do good things, not just to benefit ourselves, but for the greater good of the people around us. I, I, I live in a, in a, it's an old neighborhood, but it's, it's a nice neighborhood. We've got big trees and it's, it's just, you know, I live in an old house, but it's, 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 a, it's a nice neighborhood. I am extremely meticulous about my front yard. A, because I'm a little obsessive compulsive and I like doing yard work. So my, my front yard looks really, really good. The other reason why I keep my front yard really, really good, and I'm going to tell you how much of a freak I am, like I pressure wash the whole curb and all that stuff, like I do the whole nine yards, right? The reason why I do that, listen, is not just because I value my yard, and my wife and I worked very hard to get into that house 10 years ago, but, but we don't just value our property and our value. I value my next door neighbors as well. And if my house looks like trash, it might make the value of their house go down. This is just a metaphor, but I'm using it as an example of how the Christian is to live. I act and present the truth in a certain way, not just because it benefits my life, but it also benefits your life as well. I pick up the trash on the street, right? Not because it's my trash, and it may not even be my street, but it might be your street. So we pick it up and we put it away, right? Again, this is a metaphor. This isn't about yards and trash, this is about how we live our life. This is about thinking beyond ourselves. Well, I have everything I need. Well, that's fantastic. Does that person over there have everything they need? Well, I'm comfortable. Fantastic. Praise God. Are they comfortable? Do they have the food that they need? Do they have the shelter that they need? Do they have the provisions that they need? And if they don't, it is the church's job to come up with those. It is our job. It is not Christianity to just come into this place and consume. It's not just about you. Now, you need, to, you need to eat as well, right? Spiritually, literally. But we are to do everything we can to make sure that the collective good of society raises. So here's the thing. If we do that, right? Let's say you do keep your front yard clean. You do pick up the trash. You do live your life in a way that honors God. Does that mean people are going to love you back? No. <laughs> and that's the hard part about it. How will we react when we do love people, when we do give back, when we do treat people the way that we want to be treated, right? Per Jesus's instructions, but they don't appreciate it. Maybe it's not even that they don't even appreciate it. They may even turn on you. They may even say bad things about you. How do we respond to that? Here's the thing that I've learned. It's biblical. And I'm, I'm not, I haven't perfected this, but I have to keep telling myself this truth. It is our job to present the truth. It is our job to present love. It is our job to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control to the world around us. It is our job to do those things. It is our job to plant the seed, to water the seed. But Paul says only God can make something grow. What that means is this. 
My job, your job, all of our jobs as Christians is just to live as Christ-like as we possibly can. Now, how people respond to that is completely out of our control. I can get up here this weekend, I will, I will, I will teach, and I'm not saying this boastfully, I'll teach 7,000 people this weekend truth from the Bible, and I'll say it, and we'll say these things, and I, at that point, I've done all I can do. And then that is up to the people who have heard the truth to respond to the truth. But, but the example that Christ gives us in the Bible is that love is often rejected. Truth is often rejected. But we cannot give up on humanity. Why? Because Jesus Christ hasn't given up on us. And we have rejected him at times. We have lived in rebellion. We have walked away from the blessings of God and been entitled and, and said things that we shouldn't have said. And so because God has given us grace, we distribute that grace back out on the people around us. And we keep loving humanity. Is it easy? Oh my Lord, no. But we cannot give up on people. We cannot give up on people. We also see that David was in a lot of communication with God. What does that mean? What does it mean to commune with God? It means that he lived by the principles and commands of God's word. Now, the only way to do that is to actually crack open the word of God and learn what those principles and commands are. He prayed often. He listened for God's response and he obeyed God for what he was supposed to do. He communicated with God a lot. Now, there is no Christianity without communication with Christ. It's like if you walk up to someone and you're like, hey, what do you do? I'm an astronaut. Well, how's space? I don't know, never been there. <laughs> hey, what do you believe? I'm a Christian. Do you talk to Jesus? Mm-mm. You pray, read the word? Mm-mm. I go to church once a month if football's not on, right? Great religion of the United States. Anyways, to say that we are something, but we don't do anything to support that, if we claim to be Christians, we must communicate with Jesus. And if we communicate with Jesus, that will yield results. What did David talk to God about? He talked to God about his will. What's your will, God? What direction do you want me to take? He talked to God about personal struggles that he had. And he even talked to God about how he is to deal with other people. David asked, what do I do about this group over here? Are they going to sell me out? Yep. Okay, should I still go save him? Yep, he did. He asked about how he should deal with Saul. We're gonna see that in the, in the next couple of chapters. But here's the thing, this is so important and I hope you guys hear me. If we live religiously though, and not relationally with God, if we communicate with God, there is power in that communication. There is results in that communication from God. But if we are just simply religious, if we just come to church because that's something that people do in the South, if we just wear Christian shirts or, again, the distressed piece of wood in the kitchen or whatever the case may be, if we just do those things because that's what religious people do, we will have an appearance of godliness, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy. We will have an appearance of godliness, but there will be no power in that. Let me break it down a little bit, a little bit lower. A lot of people who profess to be followers of Jesus are still stuck in their porn addiction. They're still stuck in their materialism. They're still stuck in their anger. They're still stuck in their greed. They, they, they struggle to have healthy marriages. They struggle to raise their kids correctly. That's because religion cannot do any of those things. Only communication with God can do those things. Only communication with the Savior can deliver us from the things we struggle with and help us with hopelessness and help us with our materialism or our hatred or whatever we struggle with. Only a relationship with God can do that. Only that can save us, change us, lead us. But just by wearing a cross on your necklace, that doesn't do jack crap. There's nothing wrong with it if you have everyone's tucking their necklaces into their shirt. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing wrong with the necklace as long as you talk to the one who died on that cross. But there has to be that communication with God. So let's ask ourselves a couple of simple questions. First, are we loving people correctly? What does that mean, Corey? I love people. Are we being truthful with people? Are we not compromising our biblical integrity as we love people? 
If you're doing something sinful that's gonna separate you from God and I never take the time to tell you in love that you're doing those things and it's gonna, it's gonna backfire, I don't love you as much as I say I love you. If only the truth sets us free and I withhold that key from you while you're in that prison cell, that's not love, guys. Do we love people? How will we handle rejection and betrayal? If it hasn't happened to you yet, give it time. You haven't, you haven't met enough people yet. You'll be rejected. You will be betrayed. How will we handle that? Are you and I in a true relationship with God? Can I give you Christianity in four words? This is this simple. If you're wondering if you're a Christian, Christianity in four words. Praying, reading, listening, obeying. That's it. Talking to God, taking time to read the Bible. Listen, does that mean you have to read it all in a month or even read it every day? It'd be great if we all read our Bibles every day, but if you miss a couple of days, man, you can knock out the whole book of Matthew in 30 minutes. If we just take a little bit of time, we can ingest a lot of the Bible pretty rapidly. Are we talking to God? Are we reading the word of God? Are we taking time to listen to God? And are we doing what God tells us to do? And listen, if we do that, if we do these four things, we will have real power to be changed. We will have real power to have patience and hope and, and love. We will have real power, power to discern what we are to do, to hear God and his instructions, to, to, to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Like I said, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. We will have the power to, to, to have wisdom. We will have the power to lead our families well, to have healthy marriages, to have good work environments, to have a strong work ethic. Things like, We will have the ability to do that, but we have to do these four things. We have to be living out these four things. And as we get into 2024, you know, everyone's got their, you know, New Year's resolutions, no more processed wheat for me or whatever things that we think of. It would, it would, it would behoove you. It'd be, it would be better for you to make a New Year's resolution. And we're about to start a fast in a week from tomorrow, right? And we're going to invite all of you to join us on that fast. It's a wonderful, difficult, but wonderful thing to do every single year. But when we start off our year making it a point to pray, read, listen, obey, regardless of what 2024 throws at us, we will have the power to make it through it. And we need to lean on him for that, okay? Would you bow your heads with me, please?